Good evening, Drew. Hey, Paul. You sound amazing. Oh, I do? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely sound different. And I couldn't help but notice that you have uh, a point on the podcast Whoa. doc here. So so tell me what's going on. Like, so, so, so I haven't changed anything in my actual setup, but I have changed something in the production. Okay. 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 So this has been nagging me literally for 76 episodes. Uh, and I think I fixed it for episode 77. It's probably something that nobody but me notices, and it doesn't happen all the time. But and this is going to sound really stupid, but sometimes our silences sound different. What do you mean? So the 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 sound of us not talking, right? The the actual the parts where we're not talking, just it's just silence. Okay. Sometimes our sounds, our our silence sounds different, right? So it's not quite a hum. It's just like a different, and there's something different going on between our two setups, whether one of us is getting some, like, just some line noise or some hiss or some background noise for the room. Uh, and, like, and most of the times, like, we start with these really high quality FLAC files, and I do all my editing with those. And then, like, at the end of the process, I just ruin it all by making it, like, the worst, least quality uh, MP3 file possible. Because for voice, you don't need much of that stuff. And, like, I try to put, like, in the cuts, I try to put little fades and stuff. So, like, in most of the time in the out, in the, the, the file that I produce and put out on the internet for me to listen to, you really can't tell the difference. But when I'm editing it, it's it's sometimes can be very drastic. Uh and I know it's stupid, it's little, but it's been bugging me for a long time. And I had heard about this this suite of products called uh, Isot- Isotope. Isotope? It's Isotope, but it's spelled hipster with a Z. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And, like, these, this company makes, like, high-end audio software for, like, professionals. Like, and their gimmick is, like, hey, did you just record, like, the sickest riffs on your guitar and you want to put it on your, you know, high-end studio-produced album, but you messed something up and you got a little, like, a- you know, a little amp hum and you want to get rid of it? Well, our plugins do that. <laughs> wow. They really know me. <laughs> and they also sell, like, a stripped-down version of it, kind of like the Photoshop elements of <laughs> audio software called... I, uh, isotope elements but even then like that's still like 130 like it was the this price for that still like the, the, their good stuff is like thousands of dollars yeah i'm they're, they're kind yeah yeah you sent me to this website from the doc and i was like oh no D- did yeah. paul just take a business expense like no, no. Wh- okay so, all right <laughs> so, I, so i've been looking at the rx elements which is usually 130 dollars uh but like over black friday and cyber monday in fact still right now it was a hundred dollars off, one hundred dollars off. You can't afford not to. Yeah. So it provides just it doesn't provide like a lot, but it provides a few of their big their big plugins. It's got like a D hum, a D click, a D clip, which is actually really interesting. So like if we ever like especially for me and my laughter, like sometimes I clip and basically like my my loudness has exceeded what my microphone can capture. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it looks at those things and figures out, oh, I can guess what you're trying to do, and then declips them and makes them all good. And what's really nice is this voice denoise. You can say, like, hey, I have a bunch of, uh, you know, dialogue. And it just strips out some of the noise. And, you know, I purchased this and I ran uh, our audio files from uh, episode 77 through there. And I was super pleased with how they sounded. So, uh, it's probably something that n- nobody but me is going to really notice, but uh, I notice it all the time, and now I think I fixed it. I'm super happy. <laughs> okay, now this is a this is a Mac application. Uh, I think it's for Mac or Windows. I think okay. it's. I mean, it could be a Java app for all I know. Ooh. Well, I'm looking. I'm uh, looking at. I'm looking at some of the screenshots, and like, I'm impressed with like what I assume is visual rep- representation of sound. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool pictures. Uh, I, yeah. I'm not even going to pretend to understand that I know how this all works. Uh, but the Honestly, important... I, I do the least amount. Like, they have, like, a repair assistant that will, like, kind of analyze stuff and recommend some plugins to do. And they have some presets. And one of the presets is, like, was called Podcast Prep, which I think runs it through uh, a D-hum, 
a D clip and the the voice D noise twice. Uh and uh I'm pretty pleased with that. So that's what I used. Okay. Now I I usually listen back to our podcasts after you release them. Uh just because mm-hmm. like sometimes I forget what we talk about. Um even though I write the show notes every week. And <laughs> and and you know, I've I've said this before, right? Like I've said this before, like you do most of the work for this podcast. Like I send a calendar invite and a markdown file and show up every and show up every Thursday. Like that's literally the extent of my involvement here. Like you're the one doing all the hard work. So like the fact that you're able to find these types of like resources is pretty impressive to me. And I've never taken any issues with the way you edit the podcast. I think you do a phenomenal job, even without the assistance oh, of software. You. Like if yeah. you tell me this makes the podcast sound better, then I, I'm I'm perfectly happy to go have these with you. <laughs> no, no, listen. I'm perfectly no, happy no, to go no, have these with no, you on no, any software no. you need. Nope, nope, nope. Nope. This, I'm good. This is I'm a team sport. Happy. It was it was it was thirty dollars. It was a hundred dollars off. One hundred dollars off. One hundred. And as soon as as soon as I saw that, I was like, huh, thirty bucks? And then I just immediately bought it and I started playing around with it and uh you know, I pulled some of the I think like episode seventy six was one that like really, I mean, again, so really stuck in your craw. Silent sound yeah. different, yeah. So I went back and I ran through them of those files again, and I was like, oh wow, this really does make it's it's a little difference. And again, like I'm when I hit export in Ferrite, the application I use for you know actually doing the edits, like I it's it's like a it's just a pure pure crappy uh mp3 file like i just there is no quality it's it's mono it's at a really low bit rate you know it makes the files like really small i think like you were usually under like 30 megs uh well okay now but now there 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 but, there is an apple sized elephant in the room and i okay. think that uh loyal listeners all six of them uh would probably realize that you and i are both really big apple fans so the question i have is mm-hmm. Why wouldn't you use something like Logic for this? Uh, Logic's really expensive. Well, I mean, uh. granted, granted, <laughs> right? I mean, I feel like you can get a copy of Logic through like your wife's education discount pretty cheap. But, but, yeah. uh, uh, like, let's assume, right? Uh, uh, let me jump ahead. Here's where I'm going with this. Like, on a scale of one to Logic, like, where is this Isotope stuff? Like, where where is this company? Okay, so. Uh, I mean, I think from what I understand is uh, Isotope kind of fits in, like, Logic's really good about organizing and doing cuts and, like, balancing audio and stuff. Like, that's what it's really good for. So, like, Mm -hmm. you could use it, like, if you had multiple guitar tracks and a drum track and a vocal track, right, you could mix those together and make a song, right, or a whole album. Where Isotope's really like, hey... You recorded something, and there's some problems with the recording, mm-hmm. right? There's a click, there's AC noise, like there's like there's amp hum, like that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And Isotope will go through and take that stuff out, so you could run your stuff through Isotope before you put it into Logic. For all I know, the like the multi thousand dollar one, like plugs into Logic and does really well. Uh, so like I'm not doing that, right? I have I have two tracks. Their voice, they're easy to line up. Uh, I just needed something like I wanted something that allowed me to do edits quickly. Uh, wasn't wasn't hard to use, and had good uh, auto leveling, which is basically making sure that like you and I, you know, one of us isn't really loud and the other one's not really quiet. And uh, so, like originally when I picked Ferrite, it was simply because I listen to a lot of other podcasts because I'm a fancy podcast boy, and. Uh, one of the uh, – it was the Upgrade podcast where they, they talk about tech. Surprise, it's two white guys talking about tech. That's what the podcast is. Uh, and one of them has started editing his podcast with Ferrite. It was you know an iPad app. I had a brand new like iPad Pro that it was just itching to be used for something. And Ferrite is like $20 uh, on the Mac App Store. Let's see if I can uh, – so I used that. There was some really good uh, – it's free and it has an in-app purchase or something. It was like 30 bucks, 30 bucks, 30 bucks total, right? 
Uh, I'm gonna drop this link in there. So I started using that. I watched some YouTube videos. It was really simple to use. I really liked it. Uh, and that's what I've been going with. It, it works for me. It, it works well. Uh, I can get the whole edit done in about an hour and a half. Hmm. So it's about 1.5 the length of the podcast. <laughs> okay. So now, uh, yeah, I'm happy. But but this is now. Hopefully, it sounds better. Okay. Yeah, I I saw this I saw this note in the in the doc and I did not click the link because I sort of wanted to do it like and get real time reaction. But I, I'm happy if you're happy if you tell me that this makes the podcast sound good. Like I I believe you. So it it, it, it makes me happy at least. Okay. Oh. All right. So uh, I didn't really get a chance to talk about this last week, but I am officially mm-hmm. out of corn. Actually. Yeah, I would have talked about this last week because we recorded last week on a Friday. So as of Friday last week, this is we're recording this on December 3rd. So this was like the day after Thanksgiving here in America. Uh, my quarantine was officially over. Uh, for those of you that are kind of coming into this late, I uh, was quarantined and I self-isolating because of some COVID exposure here at the house. Uh, we were we were officially a... Uh, a house, a house full of, of COVID. Like we were just, it was COVID all the way down here. Um, and it just feels really good to get back out and be a member of like society. Like I actually back at the gym and like, I'm completely sore. Like my body is completely just tore up and, uh, <laughs> we're excited to get back out into the world again. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, granted, right. Like I know that like the death toll in this country is like horrible and everybody's getting infected and the ramp and the virus is like, you know, running wild through our States. Uh, but uh, here, here in the Fergiewell household, uh, we really didn't have any major like life altering symptoms. Like I, I barely had any, like I honest to goodness, like if there, if there weren't COVID tests involved, I just thought I would have like eaten something bad because like my major symptoms were just lots of pooping. Um, (laughs) <laughs> but like, and I, I guess that's like a symptom of it. I, I think I read that somewhere. And then like, uh, my lady friend, like she lost her sense of taste and smell and that that's all back. Like she, like she got everything back and you know, I'm back to a regular poop cycle and like, like that only lasts, like that lasted a day. Like it wasn't even that bad. Like I just, it was just, it just sucked because like I work at home, like I, even before all this started, like I just started where I was working at home already, but like without any sort of travel in my life and you know, just being overly stuck at home, like over the, over the week of vacation that I had, like I was originally going to go see my parents and things like it just, it just was not, it just was not a good time. And I'm really hoping that this vaccine stuff like lands and, and does everything that it says it needs to do. So like we can like start to get back to normal by 2021. I don't know, but I'm just, I'm just here to say publicly that I'm very, very pleased that I'm out of quarantine. I'm probably not contagious anymore and i just i want to get out and do things excellent yeah, yeah i'm ready for that vaccine juice just stick a, i want i want to be full of that juice I, you know it's full it's funny it. like i want to be full i want to be full of the juice too but like i um i don't want to be the first person in line you know what i mean like i want I, I can yeah I, I want to yeah, be yeah. like i want to be like wave two I, I mean, assuming wave two is like in January or February, because I think wave one is going to start soon. I think. I don't know. I know that the UK just approved it, but. Yeah. Everything I've heard is like, unless like you're in a high density, high risk environment, it's probably going to be like April. Oh, boy. OK. But because it gets a ramping up production, they have to figure they have to get the transport out. You know, the they're trying to reduce the. But who knows? It could be sooner. Uh, but eh, April. Yeah. Yeah. And then it requires, uh, from what I understand, both of the vaccines that have been, like widely talk about, both of them require two injections Ugh. to be. So you have to you have to get one and then wait a week and get another. Uh, and then you have to wait a week after that for it to be, uh, I think, for, like what they would consider to have like the the, the juice does right. all of its all of the juice all uh, the the fully- the juice has like fermented inside of you like the and. From what I understand, the vaccine is not a pleasant experience. Oh boy. The the side effects are high, oh. so they're basically expecting uh, expect twenty four hours of flu like symptoms uh, after the injection. That's not great. Uh, it's not great for Bitcoin. I think no, <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, it's going to be worth it. So yeah, I'm ready for the juice now. 
you you've sort of talked about your son and and how he plays with vaccines like will he be able to get this so fun fact about vaccines uh there is no ethical way to test a new vaccine on children so this vaccine all new vaccines are adult only Mm. Mm, just like my favorite stores Uh, mm -hmm, mm. what happens is after a vaccine is widespread in adults they will start testing it uh they will start basically going can we know what a safe dose is for an adults and they will start doing tests on like older kids like 16 to 18 oh like the Uh, mean ones and and then and then yeah and then start working their way back so it really takes years before an approved vaccine is safe for children or like all age ranges because there's no ethic like you know a brand new untested vaccine it's one thing if an adult takes it and they have a symptom and they die right like well he knew the risk you know it was going in but if they do it to a kid (laughs) regardless of how many paperwork like how much you know like it's just yeah like they said like there's no ethical way of testing an untested vaccine on children. Hmm. Okay. So they don't. So it will be a while before Zach can get it. But like, but you've talked yeah. about like how Zach is now starting to get like Zach, like vaccines, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I think once it's ready, he definitely would get it. And, and like, like his exposure is limited, right? It's, it's school. That would be where he would get something. And we're hoping that like, you know, enough adults, get it that it will kind of just go away where you're not without kids having to have to have it and he'll be fine to go back uh even then like his doctors they're generally like well you know what with the with the low dose of immunosuppressant he's on if he got covid he would probably be okay like we'd want to watch him Hmm. but it probably would be fine so uh yeah but who knows that kid has had so many weird health things we just don't want to risk it uh right He's he's an anomaly, but yeah, I'm just hoping things go back to normal soon. I'm hoping by summer. That's my goal. I like just you know, like let's go on a vacation. <laughs> yeah, I and not feel like we're. Still I going. really yeah. want to like not going on vacation this past year was, was was very detrimental to me. Like I had plans to go to the beach and visit some friends and things, and all that got nuked. And like I have I have a lot of vacation days. I'm, I'm actually going to be forfeiting some vacation days. Like I'm, I'm I took the week of thanks oh, I, I took yeah. the week of Thanksgiving off, and then I also uh, took the week of Christmas off. Um, and I I think I'm actually going to be forfeiting like two whole vacation days because I just I just never use them right. Oh. And like and our and like I said, our management is like gung ho about using vacation days. So yeah, I'm I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, okay, so I have a pretty big bone to pick with you. Uh-oh. Uh, over this next topic. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we have talked about our keyboard snobbery on this podcast and our mm-hmm. mouse snobbery on this, pe- mm-hmm. on this podcast. And, yes. and I remember that you, uh, when you got the keyboard that you were using up until what I assume is recently from what yes. we're about to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, you weeks. made a really big deal about, about doing the research and mm-hmm. you know, did. you, you, you bought what, what I consider to be one of the nicest mechanical keyboards that you can buy. And you originally bought a code keyboard, right? Yes. A code keyboard. They're produced by uh W A S D keyboards. And like, right. I, I, I still like the code. I still, I, it's sitting on my floor right now. Yeah, so you bought a new keyboard, and I'm. I did, I did, I did. I bought a new keyboard, and 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 here here's my thing, right? Code keyboards are not cheap. They, no, no. from what I understand, they're they're very well built. They have a, mm-hmm. a a large variety of switches and everything. So when I saw this link in the doc this week, I was like, did his keyboard break? Because that was the only thing I could arrive at that you would that you would get a keyboard that was not another code keyboard or one that is, well, let's just say it. Half as much as probably what you paid for the code. Yes, it absolutely was half as much. Okay, so um, so so help me understand. So, uh, I've been thinking about getting a different keyboard for uh, a couple of reasons. One, uh, FOMO, just fear of missing out. There's a lot of really interesting things happening in the mechanical keyboard world. Uh, my my keycaps on my code keyboards were starting to wear off and it was starting to look kind of grungy. And I first started looking at like getting some replacement keycaps, 
but it's really hard to find like replacement key. Like, the Code keyboard mm-hmm. is a great keyboard, right? It's it's backlit. It's got a steel plate on the bottom, so it, like it doesn't slide around. You can get any kind of switches you want for them. It's a tasteful white backlight, not a gross RGB. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it, it has a bunch of dip switches, so you can change it to be like Dvorak, Mac, you know, Dvorak or QWERTY, uh, Mac versus Windows layout. Uh, and it was it was fine, but I, I just wanted to kind of get something new and, and explore. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of like the trends for new mechanical keyboards are kind of minimal, right? There's not a lot of extra besides the keys. And like the code keyboard is a chunky boy. It's heavy. It is thick. It's got big, thick kind of, you know, margins around the key. So it takes up a lot of space, right? Uh, it's a ten, I got a, I got the 10 keyless one, but it's still got some pretty thick margarine. So it's, it's, it's big. Uh, and I also was really kind of curious about optical switches. Uh, have you heard anything about optical switches, Drew? No, 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 no. Yeah. And, 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 and here's where, like, I know a lot about mechanical keyboards, but even when I was looking at the code keyboard, I'm probably not as up to date on the different switch types as there are. So I'm looking at the link you put in our document that will be in our show notes. And I'm seeing that there are three switch types. Okay. Yes. There are, how do you say that word? Gate, gat, gator, gateron, gateron. Gator. I think it's gateron. I could be wrong. Gateron. But yeah, yeah. Gateron mechanical, gateron hot swappable, and keycon, keycon optical. And what I find most interesting about this list is it doesn't say cherry. Okay, yeah. The, okay. So I bought uh, a keyboard from a company called Keychron. Uh, they're very, uh, they're very popular right now, and especially against Mac users because, like, by default. Uh, the, the the keyboard comes in a Mac layout with like Mac keys on it, right? Like it's it's it also comes with like a Windows key and stuff, so you can swap things out and you can switch it from Mac to Windows mode. But like out of the box, it comes for Windows, not for Windows for Mac OS, the better operating system. Uh, so I've been hearing about it a lot on podcasts and reading about it, and uh, they're very popular right now. Like. Like I had to wait probably two months to get the the combination that I wanted back in stock, uh, hmm. and then when I when I bought them, uh, I, I when it came back in stock, I immediately bought it. And they sell two big types of switches, right? The, the Gatron and the Gatron Mechanical and the Keychron Optical. And the Gatrons they're very much like cherries, right? They look like cherries. In fact, I actually believe they're even compatible with cherry switches, right? They're almost exactly the same. They have a little bit of different characteristics. But for all intents and purposes, they're the, they're the same, you know, cherry switches that most, you know, most people or have been exposed to uh, where there's literally, you know, there's a spring, there's a mechanical thing. You push it down, it makes a click and, uh, you know, and then, you know, magic happens. E appears on your keyboard. Uh, optical work pretty much the same way, but instead of, you know, the, the, you know, pieces of metal touching each other in, in the keyboard. It uses light. Uh, the big difference is, uh, in theory, they have double the lifespan of a mechanical switch. Uh, not that I would ever, uh, you know, use a, use things that, you know, that long. Uh, and also since they don't have that mechanical, like there's less, I guess resistance, they're, they're, they're an easier push, right? It requires less force to use an optical switch than it does to require and then on a typical mechanical switch. Uh, now, what they also do is their keyboards, you know, you can buy the Gatron Mechanical and those switches are soldered on. Or you can buy the Gatron Hot Swappable where literally they design the switches so you you can just they give you a little uh, you can pull the keycap off they give you a little tool you can go in you can pop off a switch you can buy a replacement and you can fix it without having to break out a soldering iron hmm. but i wanted to try uh the the optical so i waited for the keycon optical uh they come in red blue and brown i like a more uh, tactile feel instead of a super clicky so I went with the browns uh, and and like so if you look at this picture and, and the first thing you're going to see is it has a it has a very kind of unique style right uh, the escape key is bright bright red 
and everything else is like two shades red, of gray. Red or orange? It's oh, it's red. Uh, now, luckily, uh, they give you some options, so they give you some extra keys. Uh, so one of your options is you can pop off that bright red escape key and put on one of the dark gray ones and make it dark gray, which is what I did. Or if you like the red but you want symmetry, that key over on the top right, which kind of like it controls the uh, backlight for the keyboard, they give you a red one of those. <laughs> uh, so you can make it look symmetrical with two red. Uh, and they also give you, like I said, they give you, uh, by default, it comes with, you know, option and command keys in the correct keyboard layout. Don't hate me. Uh, they, they give you alt and like windows keys so you can swap those out if you're uh, a filthy windows user uh i i, I literally the, the switches feel great uh it's it's built well uh it it's very very minimalistic right there's really nothing more than a piece of plastic that supports the switches and the keys on top of them it's very it's you know probably you know, three fourths of an inch smaller than my old one, even though it has the same number of keys, just because there's less, you know, cruft around it. The switches feel absolutely amazing. Uh, they're probably my favorite switches in the world that I've ever used. Uh, there is just one, one minor little nitpick. So uh, the keys, when you're not pushing them, when you're kind of just resting your fingers on them, they kind of wiggle a little bit. They wiggle. They wiggle. <laughs> Does that make sense? They wiggle. So they're they're they're, they're slop. <laughs> they kind of they're not sturdy. Like, th- but they don't wiggle on their own, right? Like you're not just like looking at oh, the keyboard. No. No. Okay, all right. But no, like, no, 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 wh- no. So like, if you were to rest your fingers on the keyboard and you're not typing, mm-hmm. they sort of move a little bit. A little bit, yes. I think I, I'm doing that right now to my keyboard, and it feels like I'm fondling it. Yeah, I don't know. Like. Like if I just like I just rest my finger on it and I kind of shake my finger back and forth. Like on my code keyboard, that key didn't move, right? It was solid. This hmm. one, the key kind of floats a little bit back and forth. Uh, okay. I wish I, I probably should send you a video of this, but I'm too lazy. My phone's all, right. all the way over there. Uh, but other than that, the keyboard is great, and they're not that expensive. They're really not. Get, like that's the... get a hot swappable option. They are only eighty dollars. For, well, this is – I got the K8, which is the 10 keyless. Right. Uh, they sell other ones that even are more compact. Uh, so here's what I like about this, okay? So I'm I'm like 98% sold on this keyboard, and your review obviously matters a lot to me because I feel like I, I – I, you you basically set the trends for me to follow. <laughs> um, Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm currently looking at the Keychron K8 wireless mechanical keyboard. So what op- so what options did you go with here? Like I'm looking at the configurator right now. So I did white backlight. White backlight. Uh Keychron optical hot swappable and brown. Okay, and, and brown is the less clicky of the three. You can do red, mm-hmm. blue, or brown. Yeah. So I gotta ask you. I understand I understand the desire not to have the RGB backlight, but it looks like one of the options is RGB backlight aluminum frame. Did you not want the aluminum frame? It's a little bit more. I don't. I don't want RG. I don't want RGB. Yeah, but but hold on. But hold on. And honestly, when when I bought my keyboard, the only option, like right now, the RGB mechanical aluminum frame is in stock. When I ordered it, it was not okay. So, but 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 here's the thing, right? As we've been talking, I've been sort of scrolling through this page, and it's a very well laid out page. And there's a video at the bottom that shows you the RGB modes, and it looks like you can just have white as one of your options. Yeah. So it's like you get you get white plus a bunch of other things, even if you don't want to use them. Yeah. I'm just wondering yeah. if the aluminum frame is worth it, because I'm looking it, at it could, I'm, I'm yeah, looking at I'm be, looking yeah. at pictures. Like if you look at the like if you scroll down on the page to like the first big picture of the keyboard, if that's the aluminum frame, I don't want it because there's like seams. There there's seams yeah, in the I, corner. There are seams in the corner of the plastic one as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, it maybe that's a picture of the plastic one then. I. I yeah. I can't tell because that like looks when very I, similar to what I. Ha- I'm guessing it's going to look exactly the same instead of plastic. It's just going to be aluminum. Yeah, but when I look at the when I look at the backlit aluminum frame picture, like and like do the zoom, I don't see those. So maybe uh, maybe it, it isn't. Is a, it is a little bit more pronounced on the right. You know, 
Yeah. That would be my only thing. I, and then you yeah. did you did the op you did the optical browns. Boy, ninety nine bucks. That's pretty compelling. Yeah. And like, if you want other options, like they sell. Uh, if you like the ten keyless style. <laughs> Uh, they the K one is the same kind of layout with the same options. In fact, it's only aluminum body, uh, but they use low profile keys. Which one is this? They're mechanical. The, the, key, the, key the K one, K one, the K one uses low profile Gatron mechanical keys, so the keys are smaller. And then they have all kinds of other weird layouts. If you want, like you know, no, like you want your error key smushed up beside your keyboard. The K two is for you. Uh, you know they have the K four, which looks very. K four has a a Ooh. ten a ten key, Ooh. but it's all smushed together. K six uh, though, K six looks like a tiny boy. Yeah, the K six has no like. There's no dedicated function keys. There's like, it's all it's very minimalistic. Uh, but that's what you, I mean. I know people that like those keyboards and and because they don't want to take up a lot of room. So basically, this keyboard company has lots of options. Uh, yeah. Like the the K eight works both as a wired keyboard and a Bluetooth keyboard, depending. On- That's where I was going next because I I really like my Apple Magic keyboard because I like typing on it. I feel like it's a good keyboard to type on, but I also like that it's wireless. And part of the reason I didn't get a code keyboard was it was wired. So this again, for what you're getting for the price, this seems like kind of a slam dunk to me. This might have to go on yeah. my Christmas list. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's. I'm I'm really happy with it. Uh, you know, it, the the price was right. I, I'm very for the eighty dollars I spent on this. I am very very happy with the keyboard. Uh, I use mine in wired mode because I don't need to use Bluetooth. But you know the the it's USB C on the side. The cable it's got a nice like ninety degree angle into it, so it doesn't look like it's sticking out. Mm. There's a couple of switches on the side which basically turn it from cable to Bluetooth or off. Uh, and then whether you want it to be in Mac OS or Windows mode, uh, very, it's, you know, there is a lot of options, uh, that you can kind of like press like claw commands and get different, uh, effects. You can like turn off auto sleep. You can change the mode where like your function keys, like right now I have, it's, I may change this in the future. Right now I have my function keys to be primarily like, the like the the brightness or media controls because I hardly ever use my function keys anymore because I'm not a developer anymore. There's instructions for how to like swap that. Uh, yeah, it's a good. It's I'm happy. It's a good keyboard. All right, last thing before we move on from from key, the the keyboard podcast here. Um, can you get the mic up near the keyboard and give me some good solid uh, typey types? Some good mm-hmm. some, some good some good yeah, quality some, some good quality uh, Guam. Absolutely. Yeah. Hold on. All right, here we go. Oh my goodness! Ooh, ooh, that's nice. Ooh, yeah, I'm sold. <laughs> All right, yeah, no, I need that. I need that now. Y- yeah. You did it. Okay, you yeah. did it, Paul. And obviously, if you want, if you want more clicky, you want something more traditional like the blues and the reds. Uh, you know, I was using MX whites on my code keyboard, which is a really weird key that not a lot of people, not a switch that not a lot of people use, but I liked it. Uh, the browns, the optical browns, at least for me, give me that same kind of feel, but they're much easier to push. Brown's a pretty popular switch, right? Like I know a lot of people buy DOS keyboards yeah. in in brown or red. Um, I was a big blue guy for a while. A lot of my keyboards were blue just because I really liked the tactile feel. Plus, it like really irritated most of my coworkers. But oh, they're super super clicky. yeah. Blue yes. blue is the clickiest of the clickers. Like it's it's yeah. bad. So yeah, I would do. I think I would do exactly that same setup, and I would do the brown. Yeah, I might. I might need to do yeah. that. All right. Yeah, I'm. I'm super happy. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your new keyboard, Paul. And I. I think you might have sold me on one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, can I? Can I give you? A, can I give you a compliment real quick? Sure. This is a little bit of follow up. In the last show, you recommended the uh-huh. Queen's Gambit to me and our listeners. Uh, I started watching it the next day, that Saturday, and uh, after the first episode, I was absolutely hooked, and then it just yeah, got okay. better from there. It was absolutely terrific. <laughs> okay, all right. So, Queen's Gambit spoilers, you know, spoiler horn goes here. Paul, I'll let you put a sound effect in, but spoiler horn goes here, right? If you haven't watched uh, the Queen's Gambit, yeah. It- if, you haven't, uh, if you haven't watched this show yet, you're probably going to want to skip ahead for... I don't know the next ten minutes or so, but chapter markers use them. Ch- chap- yeah, chapter markers are your friend here. We're gonna we're gonna talk about this. So, 
So, Paul, I I had heard about this show from word of mouth and from different websites about how great it was. And it was about chess. And and I think I may have mentioned in the last show, like, I enjoy playing chess. I'm not very good at it. Same. Um, Yeah. But, like, it, it, it was enough to pique my interest, right? And I remember firing up the first episode and, like... In the first couple minutes, you kind of get the impression that chess is going to happen. And then, like, for the whole first episode, no chess happens, right? Like, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, what much, is this yeah, show? Yeah. Uh, but because it, it flashes, it like, yeah, like the first scene is like her having like an oh shit moment getting to a chess match. And then it flashes back to her as a kid. And I think she stays a kid oh, yeah. for the entire first episode. Second or third second episode. One, I think she does yeah. start playing chess in the second episode. I think episode. she does start playing chess in the first. And I think she does. Yeah. Because this is, oh, I don't have to watch it again. But yeah, it's for a show about chess. It takes a while to get to the chess. Uh. It's a sl- it's a slow burn. But they set it up that way on purpose because and and here's here's the secret of the show of the Queen's Gambit. Yes, it is about a female chess player, but it's not about her chess playing that makes this so compelling. Because because it is fundamentally it is a show about addiction. No. And about. And about like fifties and sixties dysfunction. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Woof. Woof. Oh my goodness. Her uh her her yes. Uh, her uh, yes. uh oh. adopted mother, is that the right word? Yes. I think yeah, her because ado- she calls her mom toward, like she eventually starts calling her mom, yeah, her adopted family. Uh but that whole that whole dynamic like made me nervous. Like it it actually physically made me nervous like (laughs) it i did like especially like oh my god spoilers uh like when they first adopt him and the looks that the dad is giving her yeah oh 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 i'm right there with you oh no this is gonna go no i don't want this it it went a different way (laughs) yeah it went it went a much different way (laughs) yeah and like, I wasn't exactly sure why the dad didn't come back at first. It sounded like he had died. He definitely didn't die. Um, he didn't die. He didn't die. He didn't die. Someone else dies, but he didn't die. Yep. Um, yeah, I I found that her, like, just the way she, like, self-destructed halfway through is, like, you know, it's, it's, it's a character arc, right? But the way she sort of mm-hmm. comes back and, like, yep. how she was, like, addicted to these tranquilizers from, like, a young age and stuff and, like... Just the way she kind of, like, you could tell she just lived an exceptionally sheltered life and, like, she's experiencing life in the yeah. 60s and free love and drugs and booze and, yeah, oh, boy. Music plays a big part of it, like, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, music plays a very big part of it. Excellent soundtrack. And uh, just her ultimate triumph at the end was was rewarding, right? Like, the, the payoff the payoff was worth mm-hmm. it, I thought. Like, they didn't, they didn't do a big letdown at the end and, um, like... Her her chess buddies that she meets along the way, like just yeah, it's just just a really good yeah. show. Like, and it wasn't that many episodes. Like, you, I think it was what like seven or eight episodes. Seven seven episodes, I think. Yeah, yeah seven episodes. Uh, you owe it to yourself to watch it. Um, I, I don't want to get too spoilerly with it because you know there's 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 like an overall theme of her playing chess at the highest levels that I, I think you owe it to yourself to sort of experience. But I'm glad you liked yeah, it. It was it was amazing. Yeah, well done. Now, meanwhile. Uh, I'm continuing I, I because I was in isolation for a while, right? I did a lot more binging. And the other big Netflix show that is getting a lot of traction right now is season four of The Crown. Now, have you watched any of The Crown before? I have not. Okay. Um, so The Crown is a like a British monarchy type show. It kind of follows the life of um, British royals. And I knew about this show and as somebody who has traveled to Britain a few times and has like a passing fascination with all things like British, like, you know, that's why I love my friend Rob Sewell uh, and a lot of other people in Britain too. I just kind of call it Rob specifically because I know he's a listener, but um, what's really interesting was season four just launched and season four takes place in the 1980s because it primarily focuses not on Queen Elizabeth, but on Princess Diana and Margaret Thatcher. Now, you and I grew up in an era where these were household names for us. Yes. So, you know, it it drew me in on that premise alone. And I'm about halfway done with season four. I did not watch seasons one, two, or three. It's phenomenal. <laughs> it's it, you, okay. I, 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 I'm sure that I should probably go back and watch seasons one through three. I don't really have a big desire to. Um, the only thing I would say is, like, you kind of have to be, like, 
you, you kind of have to sort of understand who some of the other characters are other than those three. Like you have to sort of understand who Prince Charles is and Queen Anne and Princess Margaret. Like you sort of have to know who those people are. And there's been more than a few times where I've been watching the show where they'll mention somebody's name and I'll Google them because I just don't know who they are. <laughs> and and maybe and maybe they make an appearance in another season and like it's more explained or maybe this is just a show for British people and us dumb Americans are supposed to just sort of know this and we don't. I don't know, but it's it's been quite a ride so far because it it touches on a lot of different things that I remember from the 80s. And I that that will always pull me into a show. So, if you're looking for something to watch next and you like the idea of of Britain, uh give that a shot. And uh, I'll I'll pass a recommendation back your way. Uh if you're ever interested in getting into the you're wrong about podcast, they recently just finished up a four part I think it was four part episode that really went into a deep dive on Princess Diana's life and the shenanigans that went on there. So uh, it's I would recommend that as well. If you want more Princess Di, it was good. Yeah. Well, it's funny because so many people were enjoying season four of The Crown, like the British monarchy came out and said, I feel like we should remind everybody that this is a show of fiction. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But it but it does follow like sort of the events of of the times. Uh, Give it a watch. If if you have if you have even a passing interest in that, it's it's pretty good entertainment. I really enjoy it. It's it's really well done. Um, Okay, so last episode, I talked about how I wasn't completely enamored with Big Sur. And now that I've used it for another week, like I'm starting to come around a little bit, but you put something on the podcast doc here that I immediately looked at. So explain it. And then I want to tell you why it's dumb. Okay. Uh, I, I, you, you can, you can be wrong. That's fine. Okay. So, uh, ever since, I don't know, was it lion? Uh, Apple has been like ratcheting up transparency effects in their operating system. And up until this point, I I've been okay with it. Uh, but with Big Sur, I, I think they made a huge jump in transparency in, in two places that really bothered me. Uh, one was the menu bar. So it's that very classic, you know, like, you know, thin bar at the top of a Mac that has, you know, all your menu options and all your, you know, little widgets running. And that sucker was super transparent. And like, it would try to pull in like colors from your backgrounds and I had like I have different color backgrounds. Like my first desktop is very very dark, where my other two are kind of more bright. And uh, for me, having the menu bar dramatically change colors, even going so far that on one screen it was black with white accents, and the other ones were like light with dark accents, uh, really bothered me. And I also didn't like how transparent the dock was. Uh, the dock is the part at the bottom of the Mac that holds all your application icons. Now, like there are some other transparency effects, like some very like sidebars and like uh, uh, what do they call them? Like toolbars in the top of the windows also had transparency effects, and I minded those less. But I could not live with the menu bar in the dock. It just made me so so upset. So uh, there's a feature in accessibility. It says reduce transparency. So I clicked it. And it's really kind of a lie because it's it should be called just about get rid of all transparency. Yeah, it's like no, it, 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 should, it should just be say transparency, yes or no, because it turns it yeah. all off. And it only totally turns it off. Yeah. And that's and that's where I got off the bus, because it'd been one thing if the effect was a little less reduced, maybe I would like it more. But for me, I use I use really colorful backgrounds on my screen and I, I've always been enamored with transparency. Like I remember the first time I ever saw a transparent terminal window in like, like Solaris, right? Like someone I fired up like a terminal window in Solaris and it was like, you could like see through it and still read the text on it. And I just was like, Oh my God, I, I need that. And <laughs> for years, like I downloaded stupid windows plugins that would like try to replicate that experience. It was just never the same. Um, I really enjoy the transparent, like accents of Mac OS, uh, even before Big Sur. And, um, like for me, like the slight, like blurring on the dock, even though you can still see the clear outline of the dock is important. Um, I like some of the, the transparency around the windows and everything. I, 
I, I think with the right background, it looks perfectly fine. Like I could, I could totally understand if you had like a darker background or something, or maybe something that didn't have a lot, like a, a lot of design patterns to it. Like maybe it doesn't look as good, but with my backgrounds right now, like it just, it just kind of works for me. I just, I, I could I don't not know. like, I, my, like I said, I have one dot wallpaper. That's very, very, very dark. Uh, my other two are kind of more like one is extremely bright. It's got like a really bright blue and bright red. The other one's a little bit more subdued. Uh, but I just, I could not like, it was too much for me. It was, it was too much. Uh, and, uh, I know I, I like, yes, I do miss some of the more like subtle transparency, like in Safari and, you know, other windows. But then again, like all of my windows are now kind of just like, white and gray and it's got mm-hmm. a very clean look that i really kind of associate with the mac uh and that just kind of cleanness and crispness and uh i'm i'm gonna stick with it for a while i'm all right i'm happy yeah. but while while we're airing grievances about big sir there's one unforgivable thing and if i have to like direct all of my ire it's one thing it's on the top menu bar now the menu bar spacing of like the icons for like one password or OneDrive or all the oh. things that live up in the top menu bar, the spacing, it's 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 bad. I hate how far apart those icons are. Yeah, I don't mind it like in the actual like menu bar and the menu items themselves. Like I think it looks good there, but I'm with you. There is too much space between yeah. like the menu bar item icons, whatever they're called. And like have you noticed, at least I've noticed, like I think Apple made all of their icons smaller. Yes. But third parties haven't yes. caught up yet. 100% <laughs> so true. Like two different sizes yes. and that just bugs so, the hell out of yeah, me. Yeah, so like so like for me, right? I have eight icons up there right now and they're pretty evenly spaced to where like they're starting to encroach on like when you're looking at my monitor, the upper right half of my screen is all it's icons all the way down. And you're you're one hundred percent right. Like the the Mac icons, like for Control Center, volume, and anything else that you're choosing to display up there outside of Control Center, are definitely just like one or two pixels smaller than everything else. So like on my Mac right now, I've got I've got Control Center, sound and volume, Wi-Fi, and then I've got two OneDrive icons: one personal, one business. The icon for one password and the icon for uh, bumper. I think that's seven. Okay. I think there's one more that I'm forgetting, but those are the ones I have up there right now. And they're, they are, you're, you're absolutely right that they're slightly different sizes. Like at first glance, you wouldn't notice, but if you stare at your screen all day, you will notice. And two, I hate the spacing. I just wish they could be a little more condensed I, and there's no way to change it. Apparently like there's no P list hack or anything that you can go in there and change. And that's just, boy, I wish they would give us an option to, to just tune that spacing down just a little bit. And I think the reason that they did it is that now with the uh, M1 Max and the fact that like it's going to be one OS for everything, like it's going to be designed for touchscreen yeah. eventually, so they needed to space them out. I mean, I think they're still kind of too close for a finger. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, well, it depends on the finger. Yeah, it depends on the finger. Uh, it's just they're they're like I said, I don't mind it. Like in the actual menu items, like the file edit view, like. I think the spacing there is good because it's text, and I think having the the you know the space between the text just makes it a little bit more legible, a little more crisp. But when it's just a bunch of icons, yeah, it's too it's too much. It's, it's too, too much. much. Yeah, and I, I I need to I need to take out Xscope and like really measure the pixels. But I even think the distance between the icons is bigger than the distance between the menu items. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, they really went. They really went hard on that spacing, and yeah, I'm with you. I I, I don't like that one. Bit. I mean, it makes me uh, it makes me want to have less icons up there, but I'm so used to have like I already tuned down and, and sort of like pruned the ones I don't want. Like those are the icons I sort of need to get through my day, right? Because I'm constantly going into OneDrive. I'm constantly. I I, I guess it'd be. I guess I could get away with not having the bumper icon up there, but I don't think there's a way to turn that off. So like I could I, I could probably do without that, but it's it's the only way to let you know that it's running. Have, have you have you um, ever heard of an app called Bartender? I have. I just didn't want to pay for it. Mm, we I, I just I, recently. I feel like we talked about this. Uh, yeah, we did. I, I've recommended again uh, a Bartender Four, which is still in beta right now, so it's completely free while it's in beta, or you can just pay the fifteen dollars now and buy it because you're like new, you're like me. And I run lots of things and lots of customizations. And 
without bartender i would have like 15 menu bar items and basically bartender is an app that allows you to uh kind of hide and manage your your menu bar icons yeah. up there and it's actually kind of got a neat a new neat feature in version four uh where uh if you kind of hover to the left of your all oh, those menu bar icons where there's empty space if you hover over there it automatically displays all your hidden icons uh so you don't really have to click on something else to to see them anymore i think that's a little nicer mm. like you know i have the i have the one the one password and i have OneDrive as well and bumper but i never click on those so i don't i can't get rid of them so i don't want to see them i click you know, on like, I, I, I click on one password a lot because i'm constantly kind of bouncing between browsers right so i'm bouncing between safari that has really good one password integration and, and uh edge chromium which has not so great integration with, with one password i just use the the keyboard short the global keyboard shortcut everywhere no. and i never that's yeah a, that's a, that's how i, do I it. should do it that way i sh- command command back command uh, backspace or forth? The one that also has the the pipe. Oh, I bar. use I I, I use it, the keyboard command all the time. I, I can't. I think it's hold on. It's backspace. The the the, the backslash. So it's backslash in the the slash. The so one above the enter. Okay. Command. Yeah, that's a backslash. That is the global is the global uh shortcut for one password, and it works wonderful. So one last thing. Uh, we mm. are officially uh. We are officially uh, one week away from the launch of Cyberpunk. That is true. Um, <laughs> very, very. I'm true. exceptionally excited. They are, they, they are superly. They are. <laughs> they are massively ratcheting up the hype. Too. I, and that's just. And that's why I sort of wanted to bring this up. And I know that we've talked about Cyberpunk a lot in the last few podcasts. But I got to be honest. Like as somebody who, you know, buys the yearly Call of Duty and has bought a few other games that he's been excited about, I haven't felt hype about a video game like this in quite yeah, some time. I, same i'm super super excited for this game Uh, now here's the question i have were you one of the lucky people got their copy early oh you didn't buy you didn't buy a physical copy did you i bought it i i I pre-ordered the digital copy uh only because i i don't i mean i have a disc drive in my ps5 but i prefer not to use it unless i have to yeah Uh, so apparently uh some people have already received it so it is real. It is happening yes. next week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did. Yeah, because because they started printing the disc a long time ago because it went gold like <laughs> early. So it's not surprising some of those discs have. Uh, I mean, they're not obviously they're not running like the day one patch because that's not live yet. Right. So it's kind of the the game as that snapshot, which they deemed not good enough to release. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. So uh, it the other thing is that today they have officially announced the release schedule for the game and i'm very excited because it is going to be launching at 7 p.m eastern standard time next thursday not Um, for me though i think console releases are all all on midnight eastern oh yeah midnight local time for consoles but for pc it's Mm. gonna it's going to launch at 7 p.m eastern standard time so i will i will have been playing the game for two hours by the time we record the podcast next week uh I if if you want me to talk about it I will. Um people have asked me to stream it already and I'm like kind of hesitant because I don't want to like spoil anything for anybody or maybe it's for people who will never play it. I don't know. But I oh I'm always like I get it like people like watching other people play video games but like I'm more inclined to watch that when it's like, you know, a multiplayer mm-hmm. like 5 to 10 minute session, not when it's a heavy story driven game that I know that I want to play cuz I don't want I don't want any like I'm already thinking about my second playthrough right. of this game. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I don't want any sport. Like, I've been kind of like video game fasting for the last week. Like, I'm just kind of cleansing, cleansing, cleansing the palate, waiting for Cyberpunk to show up next yeah, week. It's co- I'm I'm thinking about taking the tenth off of work so I can play it. Like, yeah, I'm I'm I thought about that too. I've had really bad luck of taking time off around video games, so that's something I've sort of moved away from as I've gotten older. But I do have like half of December off, like I said, for the aforementioned reason that I have to burn time. So mm-hmm. like the week of Christmas and then the day, like my birthday, I will be off. So I will be playing a lot of it between those times. Um, and I will play it. at I will I will be yeah. playing it at night, uh, the day it launches and then probably a lot after. So 
And I'm hoping that it's as massive as they say that it is. I hope there's just a, a crap ton of side quests and like a, 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 just a gro- it's just a metric ton of stuff to do because I want to stay. I want I want this game to last me well into January. Yeah, or possibly even longer if you go back mm-hmm. and do multiple playthroughs. And now I've never I've never really been that guy. Um, I've never really replayed games like Skyrim or Fallout or anything. Like I played them once and played them the way I wanted to play them, and I'm like, yeah, I, I mean, I could go back and do it again, but I usually don't. But I'm hoping Cyberpunk forces me to do that because i hope there's like choices or things that i'm only going to get to experience if i do things a certain way i don't know all right let's wrap this one up indeed uh hey you can you know where to find us we're on the internet doing their best.com yeah and on twitter at doing best pod uh you can reach me on twitter at paul baylor that's b-a-h-l-e-r where can we find you, Drew? Yeah, I'm here on Twitter at Pittfurg, P-I-T-T-F-U-R-G. Woo! So, yep. All right, everybody. Till next time.